It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Dr. Jeffrey Long, and we're going to be discussing his book, God in the Afterlife, the groundbreaking new evidence for God and near-death experience. Jeff, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Well, it's an honor to be here, Sean. Looking forward to it. Well, and it's it's good to have you back. You were on uh, Randy's and my two Christian dudes podcast. Like, goodness, I think that was close to a year ago. And I wanted to be sure I brought you on to connect with my audience here on the Sean Tabbitt show. So I'm going to start as probably the place I started this in that last conversation. And that's by asking you to share a little bit of the Jeffrey Long origin story. So for somebody, this is the first time they're encountering you. Give them a little bit of context. What are a few things they need to know? Sure. Well, again, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Long. Uh, I'm a physician. My medical specialty is radiation oncology, which is the use of radiation to treat cancer. But over 20 years ago, I started what I thought was just an interesting hobby. I was absolutely fascinated with the concept of near-death experiences. I'd read a little bit about it. I encountered a wife of a college friend who shared an in-person near-death experience, was blown away, and said, if this is real, this changes my view of the universe. So being a scientist, I wanted to get the best evidence to address that important question that I possibly could. And so I developed a website, the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, and we had a survey on that using the best scientifically developed questions to help answer my burning question, are near-death experiences real or not, based on first-person evidence, people that actually had near-death experiences. So that was over 20 years ago, and very quickly I realized no question about it, uh, near-death experiences are in word real. And I literally did this work in secret because I didn't want to offend the doctors that sent patients to me or step on toes, and I was still a little cautious back then. I went about seven years where on the website I was Dr. Jeff, working anonymously. And then finally, yeah, we had so many near-death experiences shared, uh, ultimately over 4,000 now, that it really got to the point where I, I felt I really had to share this with the world. And we had some very strong publisher interest. So uh, about a, over a decade ago, I uh, worked with HarperCollins, and we published the New York Times bestselling book, Evidence of the Afterlife, the Science of Near-Death Experiences. And when that became a New York Times bestseller, my life changed. Uh, believe me, I was out of the closet then, Sean. <laughs> and so that was a, a new and exciting time where I did lots of media, literally tens of millions of people have heard me talk. Uh, ABC, NBC, Today Show, uh, CBS Inside Edition, um, uh, even the Dr. Oz Show a few times. So uh, many, many visits to uh, New York City to be on national television. But I just kept my research going because I was continue to be fascinated with this, always interested in learning more. Uh, last year, Sean, there was a, a big contest put on by what's called the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies. And my essay updating my scientific investigation of near-death experience was in the runner-up group. I won $50,000. So uh, that was interesting, too. And that's created a lot more interest and visibility in the research I have. And uh, so that's been a lot of fun, too. It's the first time in my life I've seen an email with a subject head that says, you won $50,000, not delete it right away. Thank goodness. <laughs> I, I wanted to read that one. So it's been fun. It's been an adventure and it certainly absolutely changed my life. And then ultimately. Um, we, I kept seeing over and over God, that was the word used by near-death experiencers most commonly, although they would use some other euphemisms. And by the time I was aware there were hundreds of these near-death experience accounts, that's what got me going on the book, God in the Afterlife, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, again, uh, over 270 near-death experiences that were either aware of or encountered God during their near-death experience. And indeed, that uh, certainly transformed my understanding of God. Uh, not based on something I read or what somebody told me, but based on first-person evidence. And it's uh, been an exciting and very wonderful journey to learn about that aspect of your death experience. And in terms of the survey process for uh, kind of adding God more intentionally into the mix of how people responded, what were some of the things you had to shift new questions or how did you approach that to collect this additional data? Right. I was aware that people were describing God and near-death experiences without me asking. So the most recent version of the survey that we have on the website, we asked a very direct question. During your experience, did you encounter any information that God or a supreme being, using the straight de dictionary definition, 
either does or does not exist. And I asked that in a binary form so that we could deal with any, I think, appropriate skeptical concern. But what about a group of people that encountered information about God? What if they encountered information God doesn't exist? And so to put it all in one question, I had to do it that way. But there was a narrative response to that question. And anybody that answered yes or uncertain uh, was to fill out the narrative response. And overwhelmingly, uh, essentially uniformly, the people that answered yes, which were about 45 percent answering yes, what they were they were conveying. Yes, they really did during their near death experience, find information about a reality of God, not that God does not exist. So. That dealt with the skeptics. We won't need to answer or ask the question like that in future surveys. And again, I was astounded there for the first time in my life. Very direct question about God or, you know, some people say God is an earthly word and really doesn't apply to this overwhelming being of love that it transcends earthly language that they encountered in their near-death experience. So that sort of captures it all uh, with that question and the narrative response. So now we have hundreds and hundreds of these narrative responses describing God in more detail than any near-death experience researchers been able to uh, have at their disposal uh, ever in history. And in terms of people describing that encounter with God, are there some consistencies uh, mm -hmm. across? I mean, t people talk about a being of light. It looks like there's uh, a human form of a person kind of in the midst of that light. What are some of the like common themes or descriptions that come across? Sure. One of the things that's not consistent, Sean, is how God appears. Almost always when God is described, he's in an unearthly realm. Uh, that's typical of near-death experiences. It's radically different from our physical, earthly existence so familiar to us. It's a, a realm where uh, over and over they say time is either radically different from what we know on Earth or does not exist. Communication, for instance, is not physical like us talking. It's, it's telepathic, but beyond that instantaneous sharing of, of all information and unambiguously in context. Uh, and it's a non-physical realm, obviously, where the near-death experience is. So this is, this is the realm of God. So God can appear very differently. The, by far the most common uh, things that are used to describe God are the overwhelming light. Uh, probably the number one descriptor is a sense of awareness of God's overwhelming love for who they are everything that they are in unconditional love at that. Uh, that's another very common thing. But God can be very, God can, I guess, in this non-physical realm, uh, can choose to present God in, in a variety of different ways to the near-death experiencer. And yet, interestingly, even while there's some variability in how God chooses to appear, the near-death experiencers are almost never uncertain about, did I see God or not see God? They're aware of an overwhelming being of love beyond anything they could have possibly known on earth, overwhelming wisdom. Uh, often there's a sense that this is the creator. And so for the people with near-death experiences that encounter God uh, or what they, they call God, uh, you know, almost certainly there it's very clear immediately that that is what they've encountered. And I'm curious, just across all the surveys, um, if people weigh in on that question, do they identify God as like the Judeo-Christian God, or like, I just think of the range of people, Randy and I've talked to, some people talk about they encounter Jesus or God the Father or the Holy Spirit. Other people say it was more of a nondescript and it was just God and that being of love. How, how have you seen people try to kind of try to categorize or define that encounter? Right. And, and it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of people, uh, the, the general description in near-death experiences is that this is a God of overwhelming compassion, love, they feel connected, which is interestingly, you know, a part of the definition of love in the dictionary. So it really seems to be a God that, that transcends any religious belief. However, people are going to interpret that if they've lived their whole life with a particular religious belief. Not surprisingly, many people are going to interpret that in the view of their prior belief system when they share their near-death experience uh, on Earth. But a significant majority of people find that this is something that uh, is out uh, different from what they would have expected from prior uh, religious beliefs and something that seems to be outside of religion. And, uh, it, and that actually puzzled me for a little while, too, until I realized a couple concepts. First of all, there's a very, very consistent theme in near-death experiences. We have free will. In other words, in near-death experiences, it's rare that you're told what to believe in and why to believe in or what to do. You know, when you're done with your near-death experience, you essentially never hear someone say, go build an ark. I mean, there seems to be a very powerful 
uh, very critical aspect of near-death experience of free will. So I'm not surprised you're not told what to believe because you're not told what to do either, uh, generally, almost always in near-death experiences. So uh, I think that that helped me to understand God a little better. And, and interestingly, you know, while we sort of want to compartmentalize God into sort of one religion or another, we ask very direct questions about their religious beliefs. And even the people that are encountering God, whatever religion, belief, they system they had before, what they encounter seems to fit. The significant majority of near-death experiencers aren't changing their religion based on encountering God. They're just simply embracing that overwhelming being of love and light and and it, it seems to, if you will, enhance their pre-existing religious beliefs. I want to pull a little bit more on that thread of unconditional love and have you tie that into uh, the life review. I feel like it's in the midst of that life review, people all of a sudden experience overwhelming love and forgiveness. And I feel like shame breaks off of them so that, that I feel like that's always a significant component for them experiencing that unconditional love. Oh, that's a good point, Sean. And and just for people that aren't aware of what a life review is, around you know maybe 15 to 20 percent of people that have a near-death experience have a life review. During that time in the near-death experience, they may see a part or even all of their prior life. The life review is variably described. Um, they can have it like that. One of the more common descriptors is like on a screen, and they can see different parts of their life flashing, and yet they're assimilating it all at once. Uh, you know, sometimes I just have to pinch myself because this is incredible. Here's people unconscious or clinically dead for minutes, Sean, and yet here they are reviewing decades of their prior life. And again, we've got hundreds of these. This is a very real aspect of near-death experience. And you're right. A really interesting part of that is there's often another being there with them, and it can even be God. And yet here you are seeing, well, some things that they were proud of, shall we say, in their life, as well as some things that they did show love. and. Uh, essentially, never during a life review are they experiencing external judgment. Uh, that, again, on very rare near-death experiences can happen, but the overwhelming majority, uh, even if there's another being, even if there's God, uh, they're not receiving external judgment. Now, the near-death experiencer, certainly viewing their life most of the time, has some opinions about what they've shown, and they tend to consider that in terms of, was it loving? Was it not loving? How could I live my life better? So. The light, and of course, all these people that have life reviews ultimately return to continue living their earthly life. And this life review can be one of the most profoundly life-changing parts of the near-death experience because they learn vividly from their own life in the most dramatic lesson possible the importance of love and the harm that can ripple out in their actions with other people when they're unloving. And, and this, at face value, might seem like a generic question, but uh, in terms of Light, like light seems to emanate out of everything people encounter, especially in what I would probably categorize as more of a heavenly NDE. Talk to us a little bit about the significance of light and what people share from these experiences. Great, great question. We use the term light because once again, near-death experiences and what's encountered very often transcends human language. So you have to pick the best word because it's better than a lot of other words, but the light that they encounter is, is often described as unearthly. Uh, it's beyond anything they ever knew. And what makes it unearthly can be several aspects. It can be uh, bright, bright, such that it would hurt your eyes on earth, and yet essentially never is that described in near-death experience. So uh, the intensity is there. There can often be a sense of a being there. Again, that's uh, you, there can be like a living presence of light is, is periodically described by near-death experience experiencers. Um, the light can sort of uh, be a seemingly conveying information like positive emotions. They sort of get that sense of love. Um, it, it's sort of uh, a light that helps take away their fear sometimes. They have a through the dark area of their near-death experience. So there's, there's a lot of things light is. Light is actually, uh, Sean, the number one most common word used for describing what occurs during near-death experiences. Interestingly, the number two word was love in our research. We've looked at, at those actually words used to describe. So it's a light far beyond anything on Earth. Interestingly, you, you virtually never see in near-death experiences the description of shadows, at least in the normal pleasant one. So again, the, the light doesn't seem, to, unlike what we're used to, is not like a bulb shining down on us, but there seems to be sort of a light that's all over and, and sort of an intrinsic part of what's going on in these unearthly or heavenly 
realms of a near-death experience. And I can say from the publishing world I work in, uh, when people share their stories, books that feature you know, special insight, revelation, special knowledge that people feel like they came back uh, from their experience with that's really interesting to people. In terms of uh, people not having an understanding of purpose, meaning of life, answer to the big questions, how consistent of a theme is that? And then uh, what are the sorts of things people say they're they're coming back with? Yeah, they, they uh, commonly come back with with uh, new insights about uh, life and, and you know, from their experience. I mean, usually there, it's a profound change after a near-death experience. It may take even years to integrate it because the information they receive is so powerful. One of the more common themes is the extreme importance of love. They come back understanding how deeply loved they are, how everybody is loved. And so that really helps them to relate to other people, uh, their job, their spouse, in a different way, more lovingly, because they're aware of how important that is. And, and if, you know, it's like they take a, a little piece of heaven home with them. Uh, they often become more loving themselves, and, they're, uh, and that's an important one. But they also often understand how important it is for knowledge. We're, we're, we're in so many ways, we're here to learn. Very importantly, they learn that life really is meaningful and significant and purposeful. We're all here, every single one of us on this planet, for a reason. What we're all doing here, they realize, is far more important than just being one out of billions of people on the planet. And that really helps them too, not so much from an ego thing that they're special, but just to understand all of humanity is special. Uh, and that's an important understanding to help relate again to other people and, and uh, you know, certainly helps them to be more loving, positive people in general. But uh, the people that have a near-death experience, the so-called after effects, uh, the, the people their spouse, loved one will say, geez, they're completely different people because they, they are so changed by the change in values that they have after a near-death experience. I want to pull a little bit on the thread of uh, kind of integrating your experience into your life afterwards. Um, you know, a lot of times in that initial year, people are depressed and they're, they're, there's just a lot of challenge of, of, I guess, getting back into quote unquote normal life. But um, on the journey, like what's the average amount of time it takes somebody to for their brain to process and just kind of come to terms with everything? Because it, uh, you know, I, I've interviewed people who are close to their experience, and those interviews can sometimes be kind of challenging because they're still trying to understand and come to terms with. Versus people who are eight, ten, fifteen years down the road, they seem much more capable of telling their story in a, a way that's full. Yeah, that's a good observation, and that's absolutely true. Uh, a study from a couple decades ago suggested it took about seven years on the average for people to fully integrate their change in values, the after effects, and make all the changes that they were substantially all the changes that they're going to make. Um, and that was a long time ago when near death experience was less well understood in society. There were still some questions, you know, is it real or not? That's kind of gone today. People accept that there's something going on. Their near death experiences. Uh, you know, are not illusory experiences. They're profound and life-changing and a lot more awareness in the world today about near-death experience. So in, in the near-death experiences shared with us, I'm believing it's taking people less long than ever before. They have, of course, excellent media sources of information about near-death experience, like exactly like what we're doing. There's a lot of books out there. There's a lot, of, a lot more shows in the media about that. And, you know, of course, there's websites, including my own, all of which is giving information about near-death experiences that is, is far greater than and far more uh, detailed than we had 20, especially 30 years ago. So I think that's helping people integrate their experience. The people around them, the healthcare team, their friends, family, loved ones, uh, are much more likely to know about near-death experience and understand its reality. And that really helps people to integrate this powerfully transformative experience into their life. One of the things I, I wrote down in my notes uh, from your book is kind of uh, temples of knowledge, temples of learning. I mean, I've had people talking, sharing some of their experiences about uh, encountering kind of libraries in heaven. People have talked about kind of the book of their life, their destiny. Uh, how do people tend to deal with kind of that sort of knowledge, libraries in heaven? Does, how does that impact people? Yeah, that's good. I mean, it, it helps people to understand, I think, first of all, you know, like the book of life, you, you do see that in the occasional near-death experience. I think it helps people to understand that every detail of their life really is an important and meaningful and significant, and it's even there in heaven. And that's not surprising because, like, look at life reviews. 
They can review their entire prior life. And even occasionally you have these so-called panoramic life reviews where they're aware of people they interacted with, what they were thinking, what they were feeling, even if they weren't aware of that during their earthly life when they interacted with that person. So I think it helps us to realize the significance of every one of our thoughts, actions, and deeds here on earth um, that it really is a part of eternity. I think the concept is a, of a physical book is probably allegorical, but uh, I think that's uh, you know, part of the wisdom of the other side to help communicate as directly as possible to someone having a near-death experience. This is, uh, what it's, this is an important part of what it's all about. I'd love to have you comment on uh, the concept of kind of a barrier, a gate, a point, at, a point at which people can't move forward. Often people who were told they have to come back, reach a point in their journey, their experience where they are prevented from moving forward. How consistent is that across experiences? Yeah. Uh, Sean, very consistent. Uh, that, uh, whenever, and I, I don't challenge anybody in this, whenever you're reading a near-death experience, they're in an unearthly heavenly realm and they're, say, going along a path, talking, interacting with that other being. Take a look at this. Every single time they come up and there's a, a bridge that they're coming up to, there's a creek across their path, um, there, there may be a fence that they're approaching. Just about every single time, that's called your boundary, like you were saying. And that's generally when they stop and they often are either sent back involuntarily or there's a discussion about whether to return back or not. And they're given the choice to return back to their earthly life. And it's dramatic when they're given a choice at the end of the near-death experience about whether to return to their earthly life that has been all they knew for the years and decades of their life, all that's so familiar, friends, family, and loved ones, and yet that unearthly heavenly realm they're in is so powerfully compelling. It feels intensely like their real home. They feel overwhelming sense of peace and love. They feel they belong there. They don't want to go back to earth in this misery. So the significant majority of people, near-death experiencers, when they're given a choice about whether to stay in that heavenly realm or return to the earthly life, they want to stay there in that heavenly realm. And they'll often argue with their uh, beings with them about their desire to stay in those heavenly realms one way or another whether they're sent back involuntarily or they ultimately choose to return bam but they uh, get back to their physical body then when they recover from what nearly killed them they can tell that near-death experience well let's jump to the i guess my you might want to say the the darker side of near-death experiences people love to hear the the heaven stories and kind of the happy stories but there is this whole other side of hellish and and distressing near-death experiences uh, I guess, give us some of the kind of the commonalities or themes of, of kind of this other side of NDEs. Sure. There's no doubt that there's been a lot of descriptions of that. Uh, just within the last few months, me and other near-death experience researchers published a consensus article in the Journal of the New York Academy of Science. In that article, we considered uh, especially hellish near-death experiences, and it was our consensus that the great, great majority of those that have been reported as hellish experiences really aren't. Uh, the most common uh, experience that is confused with, with hellish near-death experiences are experiences that occur in the intensive care unit, that environment of sleep deprivation, serious illness, uh, you know, 24-hour lights on and people buzzing in and out. There's a phenomenon called ICU, intensive care unit delirium. And it's, it, it's uh, you, you can get hallucinations and the very, Classically, ICU delirium is very frightening. Uh, it's a type of hallucination. And of course, people that have a life-threatening event and then spend a week or two in the ICU, if they have an ICU delirium experience, it's frightening, they may confuse that with a, a hellish near-death experience. And it's not. It's absolutely not. Uh, in my over 4,000 near-death experiences, I only have about a couple dozen that I think are well-documented enough that I can say clearly this is either aware of a hellish realm, about half of them or actually experiencing, interacting with the hellish realm. So what can we learn about that as rare as they are, if you have a high bar of uh, insisting that, that they're really hellish near-death experiences? So from that, that population, uh, I think you could say basically, they, they do. I think they do exist, I think they're rare. Um, you do see a number of people that have hellish near-death experiences that afterwards come to believe, hey, there were some issues I needed to deal with in my life, anger, guilt, serious character flaws, and they come to believe there was no way they could have 
confronted them and learned about them and, and grown out of that other than, well, a kick in the butt. And so uh, most people that have even hellish near-death experiences don't believe that that is a threat to them for eternal separation from God in heaven. They just think this is what a loving God, like what a loving parent would do with a seriously misbehaving three-year-old. You got to do something here. What do you do, parents? So, but, uh, you know, and maybe our, our heavenly father, you know, analogously on fairly rare occasions gives that proverbial kick in the behind to people if that's the right way for them to help learn to grow and confront things. Other hellish realms, it's, uh, we've had a, several of them where they are literally in a hellish realm. And that leads them to, maybe for, uh, if they haven't done this in their life, call out to God, call out to Jesus, and be rescued by God, be rescued by Jesus out of that hellish realm. This is a, a very vivid way of teaching people that have a near-death experience. You can turn to God, you can turn to Jesus, even in the darkest moments of your earthly and even non-earthly existence. And I think that's an important lesson for them, too. Uh, so that, that's that's a little bit of a thoughts about these these hellish near death experiences. And again, the great majority that are floating out there in public really aren't, and that's straight from our uh, near death experience consensus article published in a very prominent medical journal recently. And I'll say, having you know spent the last year going down the NDE rabbit hole, so to speak, um, as a guy who came up in conservative Christian circles. You talk to people who've had these experiences, and it's certainly theologically stretching in terms of what you learned and what you you find that people experience on the other side. Um, but I would imagine one of the challenges for you, you've got certain intentions and a way you're going about the research of what you're wanting to do with it. Uh, what are some of the ways maybe people misunderstand or get wrong with how they try to approach your research? I, I, I would imagine people look come to your data and they want to kind of overlay what they want on the top yeah. of it. You're not necessarily looking for those things. Yeah. I'll tell you my approach to near-death experience research. I want to know the truth. Whenever I start researching near-death experience, uh, my pre-existing cloak of beliefs comes off and my science uh, white town goes on because I consider this to be too important. I mean, we're literally, Sean, talking about some what, you know, very consistently observed, literally revelations about the fact of a reality of an afterlife, a profoundly loving God, the critical importance of our earthly life, that sort of uh, unseen in our earthly life and yet greater reality connection that we all seem to have. So these are all profound concepts. And I'm very, very cautious about setting aside my personal beliefs. Mo a lot of people, and you can understand this, they kind of, the, from a near-death experience, I mean, I've done this for 20 years, 4,000 near-death experiences. And of course, we can bounce that off my wife here, who's read, read them all too. So, you know, we have the ability to, to see this and, and talk about anything that's puzzling. Actually, the consensus, uh, the consistency in these near-death experiences is so overwhelming, we, we basically have no disagreement on any of the major features of near-death experience. But that's us because of our literally continuous and very heavy exposure to near-death experience. From everybody else, I mean, good gosh, here you're hearing a near-death experience the first time, read your first book. Uh, you know, some of the things, and I went through this, this is what I believe now from near-death experience is significantly different in many ways than my belief system before I started this research. Uh, same thing for the wife, but you know, uh, you, you gotta go with the evidence, you have to believe that. I believe that when I treat cancer patients professionally as a doctor, and I believe that as a scientist when I do my near-death experience research. You really have to go, always be focused on finding the truth and follow the evidence and the reasoning, wherever that path goes. But of course, a lot of people, the near-death experiences are so literally unearthly, uh, it may be hard for them to understand this. We do have people that uh, the question near-death experience is based on their pre-existing beliefs. Uh, I mean, we have people that say, that are atheists, say there cannot possibly be an afterlife. And here we have a mountain of evidence that there is an afterlife. And, you know, you can, you can imagine that's tough. And again, it just takes people time to assimilate information, even and changes like that in their beliefs. It, it just takes time and a lot of evidence and uh, uh, people get there. There's there's an awful lot of atheists that stop being atheists as they encounter the profound evidence of near death experiences. And in terms of the reader's journey with the book, conclusion, mm -hmm. takeaway, how do you you know what what are those thing things you hope every reader discovers in the pages of the book? Right. I think each reader should should read it carefully. Uh, if it, it's so profound sometimes that it's worth a reread. 
you know, especially the actual quotes from the near-death experiencers. I am, I am humbled to add my verbiage uh, after some of these profound near-death experiences that I think best capture, you know, some greater reality better than my words could. But I think the take-home messages from, from uh, God in the afterlife, there absolutely is a God. God is a human word. Uh, what's out there uh, so often is described as something that is far more uh, loving, far more powerful, far more enveloping, far beyond any human language. And yet, I think that helps people to understand that the real take home profound message is this God loves us, loves each and every one of us for who we are, everything that we are. Uh, and that's incredibly reassuring in a world that is so full of unlove uh, to know how much we are. There's overwhelming evidence to the point that it's, I think it's very fair to say it's proof that there is an afterlife. I mean, all of us at one time or another have worried about our own mortality, our death or the death of a loved one. Well, it's not the end. There's a glorious afterlife, a wonderful afterlife. It's for all of us. And that is an overwhelmingly consistent line of evidence. Thousands of my near-death experiences and really every other near-death experience researcher is seeing the same thing. So I think those are two of the most important things. We have a really, we're here for a reason in our earthly life. Uh, there's a glorious afterlife beyond us. And, uh, you know, we, we hopefully can live our life with a little less fear and a little more love. And Jeffrey, in terms of people connecting with you, finding out more, where do we discover you on the web? Sure. Uh, you can go to NDERF, uh, that Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, the website, nderf.org uh, is the, the, where the website is. There will be contact information there. Uh, email enderf at enderf.org will come straight to me. And I go out of my way to answer all emails that come that, that are sincere and need answered. So that's been a labor of love in my life, but it's important. I'm, I'm here to be of service, just like those that share their near-death experiences with us. So deeply feel they want to be of service to share these profound stories with humanity. And like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll have links in the descriptions and the show notes to Jeffrey's website, as well as places to where you can buy the book we talked about throughout our conversation today. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Long. Once again, our book today was God in the Afterlife, the groundbreaking new evidence for God and near-death experience. And Jeffrey, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been a real pleasure. Great discussion we had today, Sean.